so this, uh, this is where we really start to get into the questions of framing the conversation uh, that we'll be t taking on for the next two days. What are the most pressing questions that we need answered? And what are the biggest opportunities to do that? And uh, Dylan Matthews from Vox, uh, I'm told to pronounce the V really uh, clearly, uh, is uh, been kind enough to uh, offer to facilitate the panel. So I'm going to turn it over to Dylan. Uh, thank you, Luke. Thank you, Chris, for the wonderful keynote. Um, I want to repeat Luke's uh, suggestion that if you want to come up to have a more intimate conversation, I realize this is like a prisoner's dilemma where if you're one person and you do it, it's kind of awkward. But if we all do it, <laughs> it'll be great. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, we have a great panel here. With we have uh, we have an economist by trade, we have a sociologist by trade, we have a philosopher by trade, and we have a political theorist by trade, um, Olga, who should be joining us shortly. Um, and uh, the we're going to be focusing on two main questions uh, on the panel. The the first is what questions remain outstanding in thinking about basic income strategy, and and where advocates of cash go from here. Um, we've learned a lot. Uh, there's a really extensive literature on unconditional cash transfers, as, as many people in this room could tell you, as many people in this room have contributed to. Um, but there's a lot of questions still outstanding, particularly around political strategy, about uh, cost, about details. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to try to dig into that. And we're also going to be talking a bit about how sort of younger scholars, and here we're, we're going to, to lean on Absalom and, and Olga from the Stanford uh, Basic Income Lab, uh, can contribute to that discourse and, and what kind of research priorities they can, uh, they can make to, to advance our understanding of that. Um, so uh, why don't we start with, um, with you, Olga. Um, could you tell us a bit about the, the Stanford Basic Income Lab, um, sort of what your mission is, and, and tell us a bit about your project within that. Thank you. Um, so the lab was started by Professor Juliana Bidendore, who is a professor of philosophy at Stanford. Um, and it started in February of 2017, so about a year and a half ago. Um, so our biggest mission, I guess, within the academic context um, is to provide a platform of research and discussion and also stimulation of new discussion among students and professors. Um, so Juliana has actually taught several um, grad seminars on basic income, which is actually how I got interested in the policy in the first place. Um, we also started working on an um, online visual map, an interactive map, which will be a database, as it were, for um, a variety of, of um, state of research of basic, on basic income from different perspectives. And we'll try to categorize the discussion on basic income, both normative and empirical, into different um, themes and sub-themes, so that we can have a holistic picture of what um, is the current state of research, of debate, um, and also what the gaps in the experiments are. Um, there is currently five people involved in the basic income lab, Julia herself, um, um, after myself, two other grad students, and we're also recruiting a web developer for the um, online map. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have Olga and Absalom. Um, Michael Lewis is here, uh, who's a, a sociologist at Hunter College and uh, one of the founders of US Big, uh, one of the, the major um, sort of activists and, and academic organizations on this. So how long have, would you say you've been working in the, in the basic income world? Yeah. <laughs> and and what, how has it changed? Um, I think since the late 90s, <laughs> uh, something like that. Um, so a little bit, a little while. Uh, how has it changed? Um, I get this question a lot, um, obviously. Um, and I always answer it the same way. Um, uh, there's a lot more discussion about it now <laughs> than there was then. Um, uh, and so that's one, one huge difference. Um, another difference, and I guess I attribute this to um, the role of the internet maybe um, in the world today, but um, also the discussion is uh, a lot less academic than it used to be. Um, um, when I first started, there wasn't as much, and I knew most of the people talking about it, um, and most of them were either philosophers or economists. Um, 
And that was pretty much the way things looked um, in the 90s, early 2000s. Um, and that still goes on, um, but, but it's a lot broader um, than it used to be. So those are the main differences. It's much more discussion about it, and it's much broader. Um, um, I guess one other difference is that, um, I guess tied to the second, um, there, there seems to be a lot more um, attention to the automation arguments around basic income. Um, that seems to be, at least in the US, that seems to be the, um, the argument I hear most about, um, or at least until recently um, in this country. So those are the main three differences. And finally, we have uh, Sam Hammond, who's a policy analyst at the Niskanen Center. Um, I think Sam is notable in this room uh, for being one of the few people who talks regularly with Republican members of Congress. Uh, um, I think get interested in basic income as someone who I think comes from a more free market background than, um, than a lot of people within the movement. Uh, so personally, um, prior to working in poverty welfare, I worked in technology policy, and so uh, that's sort of my introduction, actually. I, I did a lot of welfare work back in Canada, but uh, a lot of people get into it through the automation lens, saying this is a response to robots taking jobs. I sort of am the reverse in the sense that, uh, speaking to the issues of income instability and, and things like that, uh, that Chris brought up, that if those aren't properly addressed, we will never get to the stage where robots take our jobs because there will be reactionary backlashes before that takes place. Um, and so I, I feel like now that I do social policy, I'm still in a sense doing technology policy because I'm trying to accelerate the adoption of technology. Um, and uh, the last person who, who deserves a, a formal introduction is, is Ashlam Schwartz, who uh, is a political theorist by trade, also working in the basic income lab. Um, my understanding is you, you, uh, your background is in ancient Greek political theory. Is that right? Yeah, well, this, I, I wouldn't call it my background, but this is uh, the, the, the field of study that I'm currently in. I, I hope to have more, uh, more training in this in the coming years. Uh, but yes, I'm not, my research is not directly on basic income. Got it. Do you see any parallels there, or there, is, there, is there any... Uh... Huh. I actually, you know, I never thought about this, but I do see a number of parallels. If you think of ancient Greek, you see a number of periods, especially in Athens and Sparta, where you see that uh, a lot of economic tensions between the, the poor and the wealthy leads to a major shift in politics. And some of these reforms that it causes are actually has a lot to do with redistribution of property. Um, so I don't think, I don't have anything specific in mind that is a basic income, maybe the Spartan model, a little bit, but uh, I need to think about this more, that's interesting. Um, great, so uh, now that we know who everyone is, um, let's, uh, let's turn to question one. So what, it is, what is it that we don't know about basic income that we need to know both to get the policy right and to get the strategy right if, if we've decided that we need more cash programs and, and want to pursue this strategy? Um, so why don't we go down the line, we can start with Sam and, and uh, have each of you give your take. All right, so we, we, we can learn a lot from basic income experiments, but there's a lot that we can't know unless, until we have a true, a true UBI. So like in economics we call those general equilibrium effects, right? We can have a, a study that looks at narrowly within, you know, uh, a cohort in Seattle, what you know, what happens to their labor supply or what happens to, you know, how they spend the money. Um, but to understand how it will affect the macro economy, you can't do that in a subset of a, of a city because the money will leak out. It, it's not a self-contained currency zone. So <laughs> there's a bunch of stuff that we will not know until we do it. Um, and stuff that's significant, potentially very significant. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is the durability of the program. So it's one thing to test a uh, program on its merits, but to, we, we don't live in a technocratic utopia where people, where the you know, philosopher kings pick the right policies. We live in a, a democracy and how that plays out um, is secondary to what's optimal or what uh, a, a longitudinal study finds. Um, Michael? Um, 
looking at this, I guess, over the long view, um, a lot of the folks, um, even today and earlier, who advocated a basic income uh, made certain claims about what it would do, um, and if we ever got one. And, and if there was some way in the experiments, um, your comments notwithstanding, I think you're right, but if there was some way in the experiments to focus on certain questions, I think get less attention. I would focus on these. Um, so one question is, um, how would a basic income affect um, how employees and in employers interact? Um, and and I, I raise that because one of the claims that supporters have made, um, who, 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 who have made when trying to make the case of basic income is that it would um, give workers more bargaining power. Um, and uh, it would improve conditions of work, um, wages, things like that. Um, so, presumably, so, so presumably they would come through, come, come, come through by way of um, changing interactions between employers and employees. Um, so if there was some way to look at that, I'd find that interesting. Um, that's one question. Um, another question is um, uh, also in the work area. Um, there's a lot of concern about the impact of basic income on labor supply and would it reduce it, and that is warranted, um, that makes sense. Um, but another question I, I think would be interesting is, um, let's say people do work less. Um, how do they spend their time if they work less? Because um, another claim I've heard is that um, a basic income would free people up from having to work, and that's a labor supply issue. Um, but then they might also, obviously some people worry that they might do things they might think is problematic, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but they might become more civically involved. Um, they, they might take care of their kids more than they can now because they are working too much. So, so, so how would people spend their time if they did have more time, if they didn't have to, have to spend selling their labor? Um, how, what, what would they do? Um, and then a third question um, is inspired by having read Chris's book recently. Um, uh, and, and it has to do with um, how does the broader like, public understand or conceive of work? Um, um, do they think that work is just wage labor? Um, do they think uh, there are some areas of uh, work that aren't wage labor? Um, how far would they expand that definition? So, so, so what constitutes work to the general public. Um, and if you read Chris's book, you'll know where the question is coming from. Um, um, so that's, that's, those are three. I, I mean, there are more, but I'll just stop at those three, because I'm talking too much, right? So, actually, my, I think my questions are very much in line with, with your questions, Michael. I mean, this, these are things that I'm personally very much concerned with, with the nature of work, the way we think about work, and what is a meaningful life. So I think the first question is very much, uh, I, I completely agree here. Basically, the question is, what will people do? When they, when, when they will be given cash. So I think one of the probably greatest critiques of basic income is uh, folks who are saying, well, you know, you give people free cash, they will just stop working. They will be, la they, they will be lazy. And I think this conception is something that comes up from a very deeply entrenched neoliberal uh, ideology, a very weird conception of human beings as something that is atomistic, something that is completely uh, uh, selfish, which means that we have to be very much concerned with the problem of free riding, right? Um, so I think that one of the biggest questions that we have now is, well, are, are people really like this, or is this the system that caused us to act in a certain way or to reward certain actions? So I think this is definitely um, one of the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest questions that I have in mind. So, but very much related to this is a question of what role should paid labor have in our conception of what the good life is. So currently, it seems that not only we have to work in order to have our basic kind of uh, necessities of life uh, uh, supplied, but we also, work became this something that is very strongly connected to our sense of self-identity and self-worth. So I think one of the greatest questions here is, well, is this how we want to think about work or, or should we think about work as something that is completely limited to paid labor, and this is very much in line with what you just said, that given free cash, maybe people would be able to, uh, to fulfill a much broader kind of potential and, and, uh, of human actions. 
And finally, and this is something very much in line with Chris's uh, uh, comments on power and of self-actualization, um, and this is the idea of the freedom, the, the kind of freedom that we as a society want to be committed to. So it seems that given those ideas about work and labor and meaningful life, we can maybe rethink our whole conception of freedom and move into uh, um, ideas of freedom of, as, as empowerment, freedom to do things, freedom to act, freedom to create your own identity and your own self, sense of selfhood that is uh, outside of what we now value as something that is, uh, 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 that, that is meaningful. Um, yeah. Thank you. So from my perspective as a philosopher and a member of the Basic Income Lab at Stanford, um, I see one of the main questions pertaining to the um, trying to bridge the gap between the normative, philosophical on the one hand, and on the other hand the empirical research and basic income. I think often um, we have um, very important and interesting um, debates and uh, disputes even um, among people who um, discuss uh, uh, UBI through the normative um, perspective, theoretical perspective, that uh, kind of reflect certain gaps in experiments and uh, we might see these disputes as opportunities for um, designing future experiments and pilot, cash uh, transfer pilot programs that could address these um, conflicts and maybe yield a empirical result, uh, yield a um, solution. And to illustrate this part more, uh, more concretely, I would like to evoke one example. So um, when I started um, researching the, or reviewing the um, literature on UBI from the philosophical perspective, um, I started with something which is of most, most interest to me, uh, which is gender justice and UBI and how UBI can um, hopefully further gender justice, and specifically how we can contribute to the way we think and uh, value our care work, um, which is mostly uh, what uh, um, women uh, do as opposed to men within the household. So, um, so to give you some context, as people, uh, as people know, um, women often do much more domestic work, such as housework and care work for uh, children and the elderly in the household than men. And often, sometimes they do this because they uh, choose to, but often they do that against their actual preference. Um, for example, because um, men are often reluctant to become house husband and because the labor market often, structurally speaking, uh, favors men and um, um, men's, uh, men's lifestyle. And so um, the debate on UBI and gender, I think, has focused on two main questions or points, one of which is um, whether UBI has the potential to empower women, psychologically speaking and economically speaking, within the household by giving them cash as individual, not to the household. And the second issue or question is um, how, um, how we can, whether UBI is able to um, kind of uh, lift the social perception of the value and importance of care work, and consequently whether um, care work can, uh, UBI can contribute to a better or more fair division of care work among the uh, genders within the household. And I think uh, while there has been large agreement amongst um, feminist political theorists and philosophers about the fact that UBI indeed actually has the opportunity, has the power to um, empower women economically within the household and also um, improve our percep social perception of uh, care work, it's actually unclear and different feminist thinkers um, argue for or against um, whether UBI would contribute to the divi fair division of um, care work uh, within the household, so to the so-called uh, universal care, uh, care taker model, or whether, which, is, which would be really worrying, uh, whether UBI could actually incentivize uh, women to more specialize in their care work and consequently cause a bigger withdrawal of women on average from the labor market, um, which would be worrying especially for these women who actually want to pursue formal employment or have a career. Um, so I think the core here is that this normative debate really ref reflects a kind of gap within the empirical uh, literature or the design of experiments, or not design, but so um, the, you know, what the experiments so far has fo have focused on. And I think it'll be interesting to, or important to kind of use this um, interesting conflict um, philosophically to um, inform and maybe in thinking how to design future pilot programs on, on cash transfers to kind of think how to um, shift the focus or maybe take into account this question and be able to um, actually see what UBI would do to lives of women, especially caretaking women. Thanks. So that's, that's a long list of questions and a lot of, a lot, a lot of things to answer. And I think realistically a lot of these questions are, are things that we can try to study, maybe not conclusively, but with, with localized trials. And we have a number of those coming up. We don't have final results from Finland yet. Ontario is still ongoing. Um, Kenya, the, the uh, Give Directly trial is, is still ongoing. Um, Michael, as someone who's watched this literature evolve 
for, for uh, the last 20 years or so, and also as someone who, who specializes in research methods as an academic and, and is, is very sort of cautious about what you can and can't conclude causally from these things. Um, what would you expect us to learn in the next few years from the, the latest bevy of studies and, and what should we be sort of more circumspect about and, and more realistic in our expectations? <laughs> um, there's a philosopher whose name is uh, Nancy Cartwright. Um, and I think her, like she has a slogan where she talks about um, evidence-based policy um, and things like that. And she basically, the slogan is sort of like, um, if you do evidence-based policy and you do an experimental randomized control trial, what have you, um, what you usually learn is that something works somewhere. Um, it works somewhere. Um, and, and again, like the randomized controlled trial is like the, the gold standard, right? Or the bronze standard or whatever. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I think about her a lot when I read about the basic income studies. Um, there's some done in Finland, uh, some were done, I think, in um, India. Um, so there, there are some, there's one in California now. I mean, and, I, and I'm not saying they're all, they all are the, are the same thing. Um, and some might not even be called experiments in the academic literature, but I'll use that term. But there are studies in all, all over the place in vastly different environments. Um, and I guess the caution would be that, um, I mean, it seems obvious, but as I read about some of the um, reports of the studies, um, it doesn't always seem like it is obvious to people who are writing about them. And that is that um, you, you may not be able to learn all that much about um, what would happen in the U.S i basically going to come in India, but study in India, right? Um, or vice versa, right? So, so the caution would be, um, even if a UBI works, um, you learned it worked somewhere um, in a certain context. Um, and you vary the context, um, and you might get very different results. And I don't think we know enough in social science to always know why you might get the differences in different contexts. Like, we, we know there are differences, different results, we don't always know why. I don't think we understand human behavior that well, even though we claim to be scientists. <laughs> um, absolutely. You've, you've, as part of your work at, at the Stanford Basic Income Lab, my understanding is that you've been, been trying to track these experiments and trying to, to sort of organize a database of, of what we know. Um, what have you learned from that, that process? And, and has anything sort of surprised you in looking through that? Is there sort of aspects of the literature you didn't expect to see? So, unfortunately, I'm not the right person to ask this question because I'm dealing mainly with uh, more normative aspects and political aspects. However, I, may, I am familiar with the work that we are doing on, in, in the basic income lab on the experimental aspect of things. And I would say that I am I'm kind of shocked by the need to have a really strong, rigorous research design that will allow us to actually generalize some of the conclusions. So one of the things that I'm kind of struggling, and this is very much in line with what uh, Michael just said, um, is that our ability to generalize from a, an experiment done uh, in the rural part of India to a post-industrialist uh, society such as the U.S. might be very limited. The needs are extremely different, and the kind of struggles that people are dealing with are extremely different. Um, people there would t take, some, take, take the cash and will basically build a roof over their house. Uh, this is something that is sometimes quite different from the kind of struggles that people are dealing with here in the U.S. Um, so, I guess that, yeah, I, I, the main thing that I've learned here is, I feel like, the need for a carefully constructed uh, design that will allow us to generalize our results as much as we can to understand as much as we can about uh, the effects of basic income. Olga, as someone who, who's a philosopher who works mostly on the normative side here, when you're, when you're thinking about these, these sort of normative theories and these debates about, so say, if if a caretaker's allowance of basic income for, for um, mothers and other heads of caretakers is, is more reinforcing gender norms or, or more sort of liberating um, uh, people with uncompensated labor, what, what is the role that sort of empirical research and, and empirical fact finding plays in that? Um, how does it sort of help you or, or, or not help you evaluate these theories? Um, so, as I said before, I think the empirical research is a key, a key part of the whole debate because um, 
in, um, when things like these normative disagreements happen. The disagreement actually in the case I was presenting a second ago isn't about um, what's kind of important in life or what people should be able to do and how free they should be, but the, here the, you know, the disagreement was about factual effect and how people would behave, how their life and behavior would change on UBI versus uh, without UBI. So I think um, it's no matter if debate can only go this far without having the actual results of um, own people and people, you know, often behave so differently, especially, um, as you said, in different societies and in different economic realities. And I think these experiments can really show us what's happening and what the differences among societies would be. Um, and I think it's also important to kind of be able to see a holistic picture and to, um, often people come to UDI, um, support the sports, come to UDI from different perspectives. You can be a support of UDI and be a libertarian, be a socialist, be a republican, um, and have different reasons um, to support UDI but nonetheless want to support it. And I think it's important for these people to see um, the holistic picture and different reasons for supporting UBI, um, both from different political angles, to kind of have a holistic picture of the, of the issue, as well as with different topics such as gender, racial justice, poverty, um, development, and so on and so forth. So, Sam, in your, your uh, sort of work in DC, I imagine you're, you're referring back to research a lot, trying to, to figure out which policies are most constant with what we know about the effects of, of certain cash interventions. What have you found most useful as, as kinds of research and as, as um, kinds of social scientific contributions when trying to do applied work in, in a context where you're doing your policy making? Yeah, I think it really depends on the policy and the audience. So, um, for instance, uh, I did a lot of work in the child tax credit and before that, a more general you see on the child allowances. Uh, they have a long pedigree um, in conservative circles. Uh, the child tax credits come created by New Gingrich in Canada, the child, universal child benefit was a conservative party thing. Across the world, in Ireland, they have family allowances that those tend to be uh, driven by conservative parties. The irony is that the Republicans are also the ones that reform cash systems to single mothers and stuff like that. So. Um, it really depends on the framing. If you talk about child allowances in the context of this is a pro-family initiative, when, when parents have financial security, they are less likely to have an abortion, for example, uh, because they know that um, you know, that they'll have income to raise their child. Uh, these are things that a lot of conventional anti-poverty advocates may not reach for, but um, if you're willing to reach for it, you can actually change a lot of minds. and. Uh, the other thing is that there's coalitional dynamics, especially within the Republican Party. The Republican Party is partly a pro-business wing and part, partly a sort of socially conservative wing. Um, and you saw this play out with the tax reform where uh, Marco Rubio, who I work with occasionally, um, you know, put forward an amendment to greatly expand the, the uh, refundability of the child tax credit to give more, more poor uh, families um, a transfer. And, uh, you know, immediately there were coalition letters from Americans for Tax Reform and, and other groups saying, and the Wall Street Journal ran editorials saying this was a growth killing <laughs> measure. Um, so those are all things to be sensitive to, but, um, but also creates an opportunity to create like a wedge issue. Uh, and, and I think um, wedge issues are a kind of time-honored, time just a way of uh, injecting a new idea into the policy discourse. The other the other framing I've been testing lately is talking about this idea of the free market welfare state, that um, social safety nets are not antithetical to the market, they're actually compatible with the market and make the market work better. Um, they enable entrepreneurship, they uh, ease the adjustment costs from trade and technology shocks, um, they you know, reduce the likelihood that we're going to bail out the General Motors because if you have a public pension, then uh, your pension isn't all tied up with your employer. Stuff like that actually can make the freest market person in the room sort of stop and uh, scratch their head. And um, there are things that I have a lot of success reaching to because there's the conventional poverty advocacy space uh, is uh, maybe a little more evangelical in, in a lot of ways, and, and will you know um, they have certain uh, talking points that they, they want to use, and there are other talking points that they won't use. Uh, like certainly, um, 
being sort of flexible with your language is really, really useful when you're talking to uh, Republicans. <laughs> Yeah, the, the abortion example is interesting. There's a there's an incredible anecdote in um, Jason DeParle's book, uh, American Dream, about the, the Welfare Reform Act in the 90s, which is a great book if anyone hasn't read it, but where uh, Jim Talent, a, a Republican congressman, proposed a bill that would ban all food stamps, Medicaid, and uh, cash assistance for any woman who has a child before she's 21. And uh, Newt Gingrich was interested in it, and then National Right to Life vetoed it because they knew what that would do to abortion rights. Exactly. Um, there, there are a lot of com complicated intersections here. Um, so you brought up child allowances, and I think that's a good, good way for us to transition to thinking about specific designs. I think, I think Chris's talk was very useful in laying out a bunch of different models here. Um, I know you, Sam, think of, of child allowances as, as a universal cash measure that, that is, belongs in the same conversation as basic income, as a basic income for kids. Um, Michael, I'm curious how you view that and, and how you see um, sort of more limited measures than, than a basic income that doesn't phase out and covers everyone, including adults in a country. Is, is this sort of a, a useful building block? Is it a distraction? Um, um, I guess I would be what you might call a basic a UBI purist. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that, and, and I want to be careful, in, in principle, I'm a UBI purist. Um, I think it should be universal. Um, I think the amount should be as high as it's sustainable, but we don't know what it is. Um, um, and I think it should not be conditional. Um, that's, that's my stance in principle. Um, but I'm not a politician. <laughs> I'm not talking to Republicans. <laughs> I'm not talking to Democrats. <laughs> uh, if I were doing those things, I might be different. I might think differently, but you know, I'm an academic. <laughs> um, I have the luxury of being a purist, right? And I think that, um, that, that it's important for some people to be purist. Um, um, another analogy I use, and this, I hope this is not too strained, um, but I, um, but I, the way I think, think about this sometimes is that um, I, I imagine like maybe, and I don't know, the year would be 1850 something, um, we might have been having a discussion about um, slavery. And some folks might have said, you know, um, given the current US culture, there's no way we're gonna get folks to give up their slaves. Um, we're not gonna do that, or enslaved people, right? Um, so what we should focus on is, is trying to get laws passed that would um, force slave owners to treat them better. Um, maybe not beat them as much. Um, maybe they couldn't, like, you know, they, they had to, like, like, not work too long per day. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, imagine trying to make slavery more humane. That's sort of the idea, right? Um, and, you know, that, that might not have been an unreasonable position to take in 1850, <laughs> right? Um, but I think that it should have been some people saying, no, slavery's wrong, people should be free. It should have been abolitionists, right? So, uh, so it may not be the best analogy, but it works for me, right? I think, so I'm a purist, um, but I do understand that like, there, it's, it's possible that there are policies that are not pure that could be steps toward what I want. So, so, there, so there's the goal, and again, I, I, I mean, the children's allowance, could be a step in the right direction. Um, so the Chris's proposal, right, and, and fair shot. So, I, so I'm a purist, but I, you know, I, I understand politics, but I'm not doing that. This one else make the compromise, it's not me. <laughs> I think that, that lays down a stake in the ground. Uh, uh, and Olga, I'm interested in, in both your perspectives on this, since I think, um, as someone who comes out of DC much like Sam, there's sort of a, an implicit sort of consequentialism about the way that the policymakers in, in DC think that, you know, I have this goal, these are, are steps toward the thing that I want, and, and uh, we should just view how close we're getting by, by these incremental moves. And so I'm curious as people who, who think really hard about these normative questions, um, 
sort of are there compromises that, that are, are worse than, than not doing anything? Um, how do you evaluate compromises? Are there versions of this that, that sacrifice entirely the, the normative goods that we're trying to pursue and, and thinking about a basic income? Just simple questions like that. <laughs> I mean, this is an old question of you know ideal versus an ideal theory and um, I think really the best first thing to do is to think big and to really try to pursue the most innovative policy which seems the most just and um, try to overcome different obstacles um, and not be kind of stuck by these, um, as Michael was saying, by these, um, you know, seeming ideas of not being able to kind of um, go beyond certain limitations of our current reality. Um, because I guess the people that we remember most from history, the big um, policy makers and the big people who, who made really the change are people who weren't afraid of the kind of um, really uh, transcend the way that others think about things currently. Um, however, if that's really impossible, then um, I think the second best thing to do is to take the ideal theory route and really try to um, make some change as opposed to make no change. Um, I don't know if you want to add something after that. I think this is a, a great question to ask to theorists, <laughs> and especially for me, the theorist who is uh, um, with one foot in political science. Uh, I, I'm very much used to hear these kind of questions. I, I think, from a, from a um, philosophical standpoint, two things that I find very hard to uh, compromise on uh, are the universality and unconditionality of, of basic income. I think that a lot of the a lot of the appeal of basic income as a policy depends on these two aspects. For example, the idea that we are trying to create some sort of new form of citizenship. We try to remove some forms of stigma uh, from uh, what being poor means. Um, I'm afraid that removing these aspects uh, would make it a little bit less appealing. And my biggest concern with compromises at this point is this. I'm afraid that right now there are, there are a lot of hopes on, on basic income. And moreover, there are a lot of hopes, there are a lot of people hoping for something new, for something else. Um, my fear is that since there is so much hope on basic income, implementing it in a smaller measure than may, what might be the, the, the ideal or the, the perfectionist version, um, if it means that basic income will simply not succeed, it will give a lot of ammunition for people who are against basic income. So I guess the, the, the big question is, he, is this, if we compromise, and because of this compromise, the results are simply not as good as they can be, or even there, there is no real improvement, uh, that, 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 will it mean that people will be able to confront basic income more easily and to just bury this prematurely? That's my personal concern. So, in thinking about models as well, I think um, I'd be remiss in not mentioning a, a discussion that's opened up in, in D.C. Uh, with by, by Cory Booker and, and Bernie Sanders, among others, that I think if, for, for a long time, if you um, uh, hung out in sort of heterodox parts of economics for the last 20 years, there were two big ideas to transform the American economy. There was, there was basic income and there was guaranteed jobs. And we now have a bill in the U.S. Senate from Bernie Sanders that would, would create guaranteed jobs, which is a, a point that sort of the traditional $10,000 a year UBI hasn't gotten to yet, and it seems to have a lot of momentum. Um, I know uh, you, Michael, have, have written about the idea of a right to work, and, and uh, in correspondence with Phil Harvey, who I guess has written extensively for this. Um, but I'm curious to everyone, you can start with Michael, but sort of is this a, a rival to UBI? Is this um, sort of two great tastes that taste great together? Uh, how, how should people interested in cash think of this idea as resurgence? Um, ideally, um, I am for a right to income, whether or not you work. Um, <laughs> and a right to work for those who want a job and can't find one in the private sector. So like, I don't think of it as really a rival, um, um, but to me, it's, it is a second priority, right? Because I, I, I mean, I, and this is what I have said to Phil Harvey, who's a good friend for years. Um, I, and I think he feels similarly. I, mean, I, I think we, like we, like our priorities are different, 
but we agree on the others. Yeah. So, so I, I have no problem with the, the right to work. Um, but to me, it's just, it's a second priority to the right to income, whether you work or not. Um, and so if I had to choose between them, I would choose the basic income. But, I, but, but it is, I'm not against it. That makes any sense. Um, Sam, is, is the neoliberal sellout on the, the panel? Shill. Shill, yes, I'm sorry. Shill. Uh, uh, one of the things I say is that if you move Republicans on matters of principle, you get you move Democrats on matters of strategic ambition, right? Because I, because uh, you know, there's this debate around UBI where the center of budget policy priorities, President. Uh, uh, Greenstein uh, wrote an article saying we shouldn't do this because of all the gains we've made with free society programs, um, we, we don't want to risk reversing it. It's you, should, you know we focus on targeted programs. Um, you, you see a similar thing throughout the way Democrats think about uh, policy, where they will um, end up compromising on work requirements or compromising on conditionality to get their for to get something right and. Um, so even when there are wings within the Democratic Party that have bigger ideas, uh, they end up being pulled back to reality by the lack of strategic ambition because you can't get the decisive uh, turncoats from the other side of the aisle. Um, that's, I, I, I look at job guarantees through that lens. A job guarantee, in, in effect, is a means-tested program. Um, it, I worry that it is essentially uh, like a, a Republican style workfare program just scaled up massively um, and that doesn't really excite me. Uh, <laughs> I, one thing I do worry about is that, um, you know, having been in DC now for three years and seeing how both parties work, Republicans have an ideology and then they find ways of framing that ideology that pull well. Democrats start with the polling <laughs> and take that as their ideology. And, uh, and I see that again and again. In this case, it's just a truism that if you go and ask people if they want jobs, that polls really well. And a job guarantee pulls off the charts compared to so many things. But it's the exact same polling questions that Republicans should use to justify work requirements. Because they go out and they say, should people work if they receive welfare? And like, yes, of course. Um, so, I, I don't necessarily, I'd rather like find the best policy and then find a way to sell it that pulls off, <laughs> in other words. Um, it's, it's, and I, and I, I see this as part of a bigger trend where, uh, you know, for better or worse, the Democratic Party is becoming a party of college-educated, wealthy urbanites, um, and they're no longer, they're, as much as they, you know, look back to the party of F FDR, they're, uh, it's, maybe this is just a crude Marxist class analysis, but it's very rare for like, an urban elite to create a universal entitlement program, right? It, and if, if the Republicans become the party of the working class, um, which was the most recent sort of shift, uh, I see the job guarantee as potentially a way of doing something that seems strategic and big, but at the end of the day, uh, it, is exactly what you would predict from uh, a uh, urban like elite. <laughs> Absolutely, my, my understanding is is that Spartans had to do quite a lot to earn their trust. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they counted as a work requirement, but <laughs> how, how do you think about these these questions? So, can you rephrase the question? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, does it normatively trouble you the idea of sort of tying benefits to work in this way, or, or do, you, do you think there's a place for a right to work uh, in this discussion? Yeah, fantastic. So, so I think that on the one hand, uh, there's a great appeal to any kind of job security program, especially in these times where, in order to leave, in order to have the basic necessities of life, you have to have a job. So it has a great appeal. On the other hand, I'm afraid that it's kind of uh, it's a it's a uh, kind of putting a band-aid on a very you know government uh, uh, um, like problem, uh, in the sense that it will not solve like, the deep problems of our society. Especially one thing that it lacks the basic income.
provides us with is the ability to move forward beyond this, what I mentioned earlier, this very limited understanding of what meaningful life is and what uh, role has play, uh, paid labor plays in it. So my, my concern is that instead of trying to find a solution where we are looking for new opportunities to, um, to find what human, human meaningful activities can be, we will just get labor, paid labor more and more entrenched, even more than it is currently. So, uh, We'll get the last word on job guarantee. Yeah, so um, I want to say a few things. Um, the first thing is that, um, well, I generally agree that um, the right to income and to cash should be um, prior to the right to work. Um, and this is um, partially for the reasons which Afshan just mentioned and partially for other reasons. So, um, with kind of the idea of UBI for me, and I think for many people, is that um, you're free to do whatever you want. You're free to pursue a job which you find unequal and valuable for slightly for yourself. Um, to flourish as a person, which maybe isn't well paid, or maybe isn't even a job which we define as job nowadays. Maybe that's volunteering, maybe that's taking care of your children, maybe that's doing um, kind of freelancer style um, painting or writing novels and so on and so forth. And um, with the job guarantee policy, I very much doubt that people will be really able to choose what jobs they want to do and what, even what sector they want to go into. And they might be forced into a sector or um, type of job which they don't really like don't find interesting and find um, as a basis for flourishing as a human being for themselves. And we will basically, um, as soon as the process is implemented, I think we'll lose control over the ways in which uh, people are given the job and what kind of job they're given. They wouldn't have this control. Um, and you would lose the chance of doing stuff which isn't currently um, under the label or umbrella label of uh, job work, such as you know, volunteering or um, doing domestic work and so on and so forth. And lastly, um, I think part of that appeal of UBI is be, being able to decouple a few months of respect and um, the idea of having to go to, um, to work every day. And that's something which, again, UBI can provide us with very much so, but not, not job guarantee. Um, I don't know how much time we have for questions, but, but I'd like to open the floor if there's, there are people who would like to pitch in. I don't know if we have microphones going to go around, but... Um.
five thousand dollars per per child is a lot uh, fully refundable. Um, that was institute that we had an existing program that that expansion was 2014. 2015, uh, the Bank of Canada said they were having to raise interest rates early uh, because they had unanticipated the fiscal stimulus from the Canada Child Benefit. So um, it turns out if you have kids, you spend money. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know if you can generalize that to UBI, but there would be a, uh, at least in a, a, a short run, fiscal stimulus. Michael, anything on that? From the first part of what you said, I've actually um, met uh, Derek Hamilton and talked to him about this. Um, and I'm not sure you're exactly right about that. Um, I'm Der De Derek, I think Derek is like me, but in the other direction. Right, he, he, he's not against a basic income, but he thinks a guaranteed job takes priority. So, 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 I think, so it's not really a dichotomy, but it, it, it is priority. I think that's where he stands. Certainly Phil Harvey does, right? Um, and as far as like a macroeconomic effects, I mean, I, as a supporter of UBI, the, the concern, I'm not an economist, but I've studied more than any non-economist should have to, um, economics, um, and, and, um, and it, my concern is, as a supporter, has been more about inflation, right? Um, so I, and and the way I think about it is, it, it would depend on how big the the UBI minimum is, right? Um, but I guess the way the, the mechanism could be that the UBI is big enough to cause some folks to withdraw from the labor market, and then employers have to raise wages to bring them back. Um, and then they might transfer the increase in wages onto less and higher costs. Right? So that's been my, my worry. And I don't, I don't know if anyone looked at that. Well, you, no one has probably because we don't have it at the national level. <laughs> um, uh, but that, that has been a worry. Right? I mean, as a supporter, that's been my worry about it. Um, so I don't, that could be a problem, I think. Yeah. So I think we have time for one more question. And uh, I have no way to enforce this, but the more it's a question and the less it's the comment, you'll have my own dying things. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. First of all, congratulations on the initiative. This is very well needed and, and appreciated. Uh, I'm going to pass to the table a question that I'm getting from my professors at the University of Coimbra. Coimbra, I realize when people don't know where it is, it's in Portugal. Uh, it was founded in 1290. It is one of the oldest universities in, in the world. But this school of economics where I'm studying is pretty new, it's from the late 70s. And the, the, the professors there, they are liberal Democrats. They are very, very pro-welfare. And, and they defend that uh, with their you know, heart and soul. So I got this question from th in three different occasions, from three different professors, they said, and then when I explained to them that I'm going to write a thesis about universal basic income, they said, okay, then you know, that will prove us that universal basic income is going to strength instead of weakness democracy. They truly believe that UBI will work against democracy because it will be used to uh, dismantle uh, the welfare state. It will be used to, instead of progress, um, help people progress politically, it will help individuals, it will help people to uh, stay far from collectivism, and ultimately it will be uh, subsidized arguments against the state. So the fact that, you know, uh, Milton Friedman and now Elon Musk are supervised affecting it, uh, they say, this is going to be used to people. We don't need a state. We need just an uh, administrator of whatever is going to be coming to replace all first state. So I would like to hear from the whole panel. How would you repay that? Um, let's start from the other end this time. Um, Olga, do you have any, any thoughts on question of whether this, this uh, displaces the welfare state um, in a way that's troublesome. Um, sorry, could you summarize the question again? Um, sure. Um, so I, I think that there, there is a lot of themes in there, but, but sort of 
I think there's the idea of, of basic income as a threat to the traditional welfare state. I think there's the idea that it undermines democracy by creating more atomized individuals. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on those concerns? Um, I think in a way it might actually strengthen democracy um, because, precisely because it will remove, it will remove all the stigma associated with um, certain people but not others receiving um, welfare hope and cash. And um, in a way, I feel like if we all receive UBI, even though some of us might end up paying it back with higher taxes, which is how it could be funded, um, in a way, there won't be the stigma to the people who receive UBI when others don't, because it's precisely because it's universal and unconditional. Um, and I think it actually removes some bureaucratic burden as well by not having to um, means test certain people for UBI or for other schemes, but a one who would receive it will be just easier and more feasible and, and cheaper bureaucratically. Um, And, and lastly, I wanted to say that um, it's not clear to me, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, that UBI must replace the current welfare state. I mean, my understanding is that, yeah, that some proposals are such that it will complement, as, as, as long as there is money for it, it complement the welfare schemes that we have currently, which means that um, disadvantaged people or people who need more help, um, maybe single mothers, for example, would still receive additional benefits in addition to the UBI. So that could be a way, maybe more expensive, but maybe ultimately um, more feasible politically and, and um, sociologically for people to, to do this. I want to approach and answer this question from, from what I uh, actually study most of my uh, most of my work, which is the imagination. And I think that one of the biggest problems today is that we are completely unable to imagine anything that is radically different than what things are, not to mention anything that is better uh, than, than things right now are. I think that UBI should be viewed not as a policy, but as part of a greater vision to a new society, uh, something that can captivate people's imagination and mobilize people around. And as such, I think that it has to undermine, in a sense, uh, uh, the, the social welfare model. I think that this was fantastic for a lot for a while, but I don't think that it fits the current needs uh, of our society. So I will say, at least conceptually and philosophically, I would say that if we think of UBI as part of a greater vision, as part of a greater imaginary that we want to rethink about our society, then yes, it might actually undermine the, the, the basic understanding we have on the welfare state. Um, I haven't thought much about the question about democracy, so I'm going to pass on that. I don't want to say anything. I haven't thought that much about that one. Um, but I have thought about the, um, the last part of the question, the, um, the undermining the welfare state. Um, when, I said, when I first got involved in the basic income discussions, there was a lot of, um, a lot of the time people would talk about the, uh, the broad support for basic income. And they would mention Milton Friedman and MLK and the left and right. And people still do that. Um, and, you know, that worried me then, and it worries me now. Because um, uh, I don't, even though it's not true that um, a basic income has to replace the welfare state, um, in the current context um, in the U.S., um, I, I fear that the more acceptable version <laughs> of basic income might be the one that some folks at Cato supports, not mine, right? Um, so I, I share that worry. Um, I do, yeah. I wouldn't worry, I wouldn't stay up at night worrying that UBI is going to be successful and also at, at, at the same time successful at repealing the existing welfare state. It's like, One's already big, big enough to live because um, you see this in all kinds of areas of reform, especially in the U.S. Like, there's lots of proposals to consolidate X, Y, Z to pay for A, but it doesn't. You end up getting A, and then you end up having X, Y, Z still because it's it's like multiplying the number of interest groups that you have to win over. Um, so that does, that really happens. But there are some cases where you know I would favor a child allowance to replace our the TANF system, for example, um, in part because TANF has become a conduit for social engineering and for work requirements, and it, 
and replacing that with a bigger universal program, I think, actually strengthens democracy because it would, you know, a rich family and a poor family of kids would, would be treated and seen the same and not stigmatized. So there are cases where replacing welfare state is good. The other comment I have is, um, you know, there's a, a conservative view or a kind of libertarian view, a Milton Friedman view that is like, all the welfare state exists to do is redistribute, to take from the haves to give the have-nots. That's really a, a wrong picture of what social insurance is. Like, social insurance is a way we pool risk. And, there, and it's not strictly taking, it's not strictly a transfer. If you just think it's a transfer, then yeah, it sort of makes sense to collapse it all down to like a single transfer. But you wouldn't, you know, get rid of your fire insurance, your homeowner's insurance, and your uh, theft insurance, and everything, your car insurance, everything else, and collapse it into one thing, because some people have their homes broken into, and some people have their house burned down. <laughs> uh, so there are insurance programs that can't be consolidated. Uh, and I think it's a conceptual error to make. Um, I'd just like to tackle one last question before we finish, which is, um, you know, I think in theory, too, I, uh, I might be for a universal program, uh, a meaningfully large program, uh, but I really can't make the numbers work, right? It's, that is a very expensive proposition. So uh, Chris writes his book, he sort of, I think, cuts down sort of the overall level of the grant and cuts down the full grant to a certain income level. Um, and, and, and then on top of that in our discussion, we're talking about uh, a UBI as well as a jobs guarantee. And I definitely uh, can't make the numbers work on that. Uh, so, um, you know, as part of the next generation of research uh, that we need to do, let me ask two questions. One, um, you know, as part of the next generation, like thinking about the real cost of these things and, and what it means that we're actually having a conversation about the, the meat of this now. Um, like, how do we think about these trade-offs that we're going to have to make if something's going to happen? Um, and then maybe we could just pick back on, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about experiments as a way, you know, the importance of experiments. But um, what do we think about graduate students uh, who might, you know, they're not going to be able to go out and, you know, do an RCT on uh, a basic income. So, you know, what, what's the contribution that they can make beyond sort of uh, maybe trying to connect with one of the experiments we'll hear about uh, over the weekend? And Dylan, feel free to weigh in, even though you're Sure. Um, well, I think the question of what graduate students should do, I, I feel like I should pose to the graduate students. <laughs> uh, so, so as, as people who are, who are in the muck of it and, and are, are looking into this, um, what do you, you feel like are the most exciting projects in this that you can contribute to? And, and if you had a friend in your department or a, a related department who wanted to get into to basic income, what would you tell them is, is a good question to work on? Okay, um, I was very fortunate as a graduate student. Um, a couple of weeks after I started my program at Stanford, I got an email saying that, well, we're starting a new uh, basic income lab at Stanford. Uh, we are looking for applicants. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to get a chance as a graduate student who's not studying directly basic income to get involved with something that I care deeply about. Um, but I was doing what I do as a graduate student <laughs> and, uh, because I haven't figured out what the rest uh, should do. But I, I try to find intersections between my own work and, and basic income. And I try to think of how I can use my own resources, seeing the things that I consider myself or hope someday to become an expert in, how can I utilize them in, in support of something, again, that I care deeply about. So for example, in my case, I studied imagination. So a big question is, how, how, what does UBI mean for us in terms of the imagination? What, play, what role in it does it play? Uh, in us imagining something alternative. And I think what I try to do when I talk to my friends at the department and in other departments is trying to see how other people's work might be relevant to the questions that we care about and how we might be able to develop it into a research, uh, research, research agenda that may contribute to this whole project. I guess 
one thing that I would like to add is that for my perspective as a philosopher interested in political justice and political philosophy in general, I find it very, so one of the reasons for which I got interested in me in the first place last year was actually, uh, I, I read all this um, normative literature about how different theories of justice uh, can justify in different ways uh, the goodness or value of, or you know, justify the PBI in the society. And I was very excited that it can kind of transcend different political um, values and disputes. And if you have, you can, you can support UBI because you think it's going to be more cost effective and to the same degree as you your life, or because you will get more bargaining power as a housewife or as an um, employee, or you can justify it because well, we be redistributed in, in a just way. And I think in the future I would like to maybe write a paper, maybe even a little one day about a book that's number of reasons, like I said, for justifying the same thing. Um, I think also just by, by creating this huge sort of our lab within academia, it's, it's a good way of making grad students more interested and even aware of um, the possibility of research with the media in different, in different departments and different angles. And I think that um, potentially creating more of these institutions um, as maybe parts of different um, departments would be a good idea. Michael, what would you tell your graduate students? <laughs> um, I guess as far as like, I'm going to try to answer both questions at the same time, the grant is a question and the cost, right, where the numbers work. Um, so the, the working of the numbers um, is hard because you, you have to make assumptions um, and you don't know if they're true or not, right? Um, so what I mean is um, you, like, one thing is when you try to sort of cost this out, a lot of folks that I've read, um, they end up coming up, up, coming up with a gross cost estimate and then they stop there, right? Um, they, they figure out the population, the amounts for kids and adults, multiply the amounts for the population, that's the cost. Um, but as I see, that's not really the cost, and that's given the income tax and the other tax. Because we, as people, are going to still um, pay taxes on other income, and so the actual net cost is the difference between the gross cost and what you end up with once people are taxed back some portion of the basic income. Right? Um, so I would say keep that in mind if you are a graduate student or not looking at costs. I mean, it's like you want to focus on the net cost, not the gross cost. And that's where it gets tricky because you have to make assumptions. Um, assumptions about things like um, uh, what will be the behavioral response to the tax on house finance um, and to also the, the income support. Uh, they have an income effect, um, tax on have income and substitution effect, so you, so you have to think about, and so you got to be essential about all those things to do this. So it gets, it gets hard, but, I'm not a, but I would just keep in mind that you're trying to estimate the net cost, not the gross cost. And that's an important difference, I think, that people often don't keep in mind. Uh, so as to the question of how can grad students uh, work on this if they don't have $10 million in the country, um, there's just there's, there's a, a ton of different ways, like ones that pop into my head. Um, there's a great book called Open Versus Closed, uh, Personalities, Identities, and Politics of Redistribution that uses um, big five personality tests and different, other, different kinds of personality tests to look at the sort of personality correlates to your approach to redistribution. So, you know, anyone in any campus can find a statistically significant number of undergrads to do a, a personality study on. Um, and then you can learn something about how people approach redistribution. Uh, so that's just one example. There are, it's a multifaceted issue. We don't, we're not all going to have, um, uh, big MBER working papers that, you know, uh, are decades in the making. You, you, can, you can pick a piece of this issue from multiple different angles. I would say on, on, on both those points, one point on cost is that I think one of the, the papers that I found most useful in thinking of this is from, from uh, Jess Peterspan, uh, Elizabeth Rhodes, and, and Luke, all of whom I believe are here, um, looking at the cost of uh, a negative income tax and finding that one large enough to wipe out poverty could be financed for roughly the cost of existing cash and cash like per regs, um, things like Section 8, 
food stamps, uh, BITC, um, it's, it's not sort of a, a CEO estimate, but it's, it's a very useful number and, and a useful sense of scale there, and, and I think changed my prior on how affordable a policy like that is. Um, and on the grad student side, I'd say just as a journalist, one thing that I've, I've struggled to find is um, most European countries have some kind of minimum income policy. And it's not a basic income, and it's not even a negative income tax, really. It comes with all these different uh, requirements and, and add-ons, and is usually a sort of thing of last resort. But I don't really know how they work, and I don't know how they differ from country to country, and I don't know how meaningful the differences are. Um, and uh, I thought it was really notable that when Benoit Hamon, uh, the Socialist Party uh, candidate for president of France in, in 2017, ran on a basic income, if you looked at the details of his plan, uh, the plan was to uh, revise the revenue of Solidaire Active, uh, the minimum income policy of France, um, to like slightly reduce the work requirements. <laughs> um, Sam, I know you've looked at some of these numbers. Um, do you know anything on that? Can you make any last idea? Uh, I mean, there's a ton of different countries, ton of different systems. One, one, one thing that, you know, I like Denmark to know. Uh, is like very generous unemployment uh, insurance um, because the, the, going back to this instability issue, if you're laid off uh, in the U.S., you, you, you get maybe 50% of your wages replaced in Denmark, it can be upwards of 90%, but there's it, it is, this trade off of that. There's an activation requirement, right? So, um, so people in Denmark, when they're, they're, when they're laid off, uh, they, they keep 90% of their income, but then with they normally find a job within four months, and if not, then they're you know, put into retraining or um, given steadily escalating subsidies to be rehired. Uh, and so that's a way of essentially stabilizing people's incomes, um, even through ups and downs. The other thing I'd point out is one way to defray the cost of a basic income like policy is to keep it temporary, and I know that, that, that will upset purists, but uh, um, if you look at something like food stamps, uh, which is a quasi-cash income support. Um, it's the median person who uses food stamps is in the program for about 10 months. Uh, and then they, they're, they're called spells, and they normally have, a, the USDA calls them trigger events, like they, their hours are cut back, or something put them under the income threshold and they're suddenly eligible. So they'll stay in the program permanently. There is this sort of conservative myth that, the, that everyone in food stamps is just free riding off of it, but they kind of do this thing where, like, if you go to a hospital, the average person in the hospital is on bed rest. But actually, if you look at the global population, the average person is there for a doctor's visit now. You know, so um, there's different ways to, to, to cut the cross section. So what I'm getting at here is that if you wanted to have a, say, a, a, you could have a program that was like, you know, with, within a 10 year span, you get to access two years of basic income. <laughs> as you have allotted however you want it, and maybe you can cut the amount in half and double the frequency or something like that, then that would function to, you know, if you had a life event that was a big income shock and a big source of income instability to access a universal income support program that didn't have any restrictions on how you use the money or penalize you for going back to work or anything like that. So that's, that's an option that I haven't seen explored enough, but that's sort of like that those things already works, just not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to be clear, your food stamps doesn't kick you off if you, you still qualify after 10 months. It's just most people recover economically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we might have time for, for a couple more questions. Um, oh, do we not? No, I'm, I'm waiting for the opportunity. Uh, so at this time, once again, thank you very much to, to Dylan and all the panelists. <laughs>